But I'd like to uh, introduce our next creator artist. Um, our next creator artist is Ansley Hildial. <laughs> Ansley Hildial earned a PhD in range management from Texas Tech and then realizing the need for aesthetic growth, pursued an MFA in sculpture at, from the University of Georgia. Her work asks, what makes us comfortable and uncomfortable on the rangelands of Wyoming? And how do we deal with survival as inhabitants of this planet? She uses the shapes and conformations of shrubs, the most disparaged and unappreciated but vitally important plants of the Western landscape, to understand and speak about the connections we as humans share with each other and the organisms that we've marginalized in the world around us. The tenacious, patient, and wise sagebrush have been her teacher from which she has learned the importance of perspective and change in developing methods for seeing the land as artwork. Ansley is the coordinator for rangeland sculpture at the University of Wyoming. <laughs> she has taught a number of courses, including the ecology of form, grasslands as mediums of world making, the beauty of shrubs, rangeland management as artistic installation, restoring disturbed ecosystems and artists, <laughs> and the invasion of plants and ideas. <laughs> Dr. Hildile has presented her work at the National Ornamental Metals and Shrubs Museum in Kansas City and the Artists and Ecologists Gallery in New Orleans, Louisiana. Her recent publications include Biological Crusts as Functional Sculptures on the Sagebrush Step, which was published in Ver the Ver Journal of Verdant Arts and Arid Environments. <laughs> and resistance and resilience of dynamic sculptures to invasion by transplanted aesthetic concepts. <laughs> a metaphor of cheatgrass on western rangelands published in Art and Land Reclamation. <laughs> Dr. Hildile's current project is an investigation through data collection and art making into the question of why people so often respond with confusion or even malice towards sculptures and shrubs. <laughs> Once again, this is a playful mashup of the lives and works of two people. My intention is to break down the norms and expectations of the form called an introduction. <laughs> Just as these two faculty broke down the barriers between plant ecology and art. I encourage you to go to the UW websites for the departments of art and, e and ecosystem science and management to disentangle the lovely mess that I've made out of the impressive work of Ashley Carlisle and Anne Hill. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Well, one of the things that I do a lot is, is uh, take folks out on the landscape and talk to them about what's out there, uh, what's going on in ecology, what's on the landscape. And I've always been struck, and I have many stories which I can tell you at lunch, about um, perception and this notion of what we see based on where we come from. And so on a rangeland system, when you look at this beautiful landscape that you cross, you see something that's calming, something that draws you in. Folks often go to the landscape to become calmed. Okay? And this group, I took to the landscape and asked, this is beautiful to you, right? What do you see? Where do you go on this landscape and why? And then often when I ask that question, I'm just dumbfounded because the place that I would go to is entirely different than the place that everyone else goes to. And so if you're thinking about that in your mind, you're looking at this landscape, I'm thinking, well, you know, not so much. I, I think I... <laughs> We, something's missing, right? So I'm a shrub ecologist. I think that shrub components add to a grassland system. And uh, during the meeting of this project, I went and borrowed a shovel uh, from the folks, that, the staff here, and Mike said to me, uh, what are you gonna do with that shovel, Ann? You know, I don't know what's going on. And I said, well, you know, unfortunately, I have to go out there and dig up a shrub. And he says, oh, hey, 
dig a lot of them. <laughs> and when you're done, take them home with you, will you? <laughs> Right. So our perception is very different about what's valuable on this landscape. And when I see this landscape, I, I'm bothered by that kind of pinkish purple color out there, which is an invasive species that was introduced to uh, North America many years ago, many times, and now it's uh, predominant in the landscape in some places. And what I really like about this image is that my eyes go immediately to the shrubs, right? And Shrubs are important to me because not of what is happening above ground, although there is a lot happening above ground when you add shrubs to a grassland system, but I also visualize what's going on below ground. So in dry systems, most of the action in ecology is below ground, and so I start thinking about movement of water through a soil profile, I think about the biological organisms in that soil, the turnover in nutrients. I think about process and function, right? And so it's important to know that a lot of the landscapes that are in dry or harsh environments have much going on below ground, and scientists are not very good at all about measuring that, and then when I try to talk about it, I'm not very good about talking about it. And so this alliance is something that will help me to give you a different vision of that landscape. Okay, but what it, I'm not gonna offer you is all of the <laughs> arrows <laughs> and boxes and terminology of a scientist in this system. I am gonna give you though the two players that we're going to talk about for a little bit that we found a way to join forces and to expand our minds about how we see the landscape. Okay, uh, Downy brome, Bromus tectorum, cheatgrass is that an introduced exotic species, and sagebrush, as you know, is kind of the icon of the West, and for me, what I do a lot of research on, and what I see below ground in terms of the differences between these is the difference between an annual plant, if you think about it, that has to do its entire life cycle in one year compared to a perennial plant that does its entire life cycle over the lifespan about equal to ours, okay? So if you imagine yourself completing everything you've done in your life in a single year and compare that to our lifespan, you think about the depth of the development of your life, and I think about the depth of the development of the roots below the plants. I'm gonna stop there. So from the beginning when we started, how many days ago? 10 days ago. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny because every single one of us, I think every day has been saying, what day is it? What, is it Thursday, what day is it? Um, from the very beginning, when we all got here last Wednesday, um, the next day we started right out going into the landscape and really exploring it. Um, and she was our biggest teacher from day one. I think all of us, what's that, what's that? What does this do? You know, what's happening with this? And um, as a scientist, Anna's a very visual person. She explains things with great detail. Um, that you can imagine, you can see it, even what's happening underneath the ground. Um, so I just, I was drawn to her from the beginning. Um, I think it was, it was a pairing that I'm sure Jeff had a lot to do with, but that I think both of us said, yes, we want to pair together. We want to, to join forces. So she introduced me and really clarified terms like invasive, native, exotic, wheat grasses, brome grasses. Um, and how all of these affect our landscape, whether for the better or for the worse. Um, within my work, I've always, I've worked with seeds for a very long time, um, even I think even before 2005 when Hurricane Katrina hit my hometown of New Orleans. So with seeds in my work, I use them as actual seeds, metaphorical seeds, small, large, loud, quiet, um, but for the most part, very optimistic. Um, Again, working with different scales, so very small wall pieces, as well as larger scale installations. 
Um, but I've never really focused on Wyoming seeds um, in any way, shape, or form, or Wyoming plants, really. It's always been kind of thinking back about home in another place. When I've been here almost 12 years now, this is home. Um, so it, it just, I was, it was one of the main reasons I was so excited to actually be a part of this project, to actually get a chance to learn from the experts um, about our landscape, about everything within it. So, you know, there are a lot of commonalities between scientists and artists. My best friend JJ pounds this into my head when I'm feeling a little insecure about being around some of these folks. Um, and, and those include pattern and process. We're embedded in them. And we're also all trained observers, which is um, huge um, in all of our worlds. So, so commonalities between the, the group as a whole spawn lots of conversations. Um, about all of these things, about what we had seen out in the landscape, but we also were able to tie things in together and make um, connections about our lives, not only as working professionals, but as um, humans. Um, commonalities particularly stood out to me in terms of balance. How do you balance life and work? And we all struggle that, which is both um, comforting and, and a struggle to think about. And so it was nice to just sit around the dinner table and literally talk about, well, how do you balance life and work? And you know, what kind of strategies do you have? So this balance is huge in art. I mean, it's in everything that we do. Um, throwing something off balance um, for a reason so that you get someone to focus on something particular within an artwork. Um, this led to discussions between um, Anne and I from day one when we each had an hour with everyone to see where we were gonna go. Um, we went out into the landscape, we're looking at, at all of the plants, I'm imagining what's going on underground, and the first thing I think, well, what would that be like? What would it be like if we were actually a bug or a microscopic organism underneath the soil and we were experiencing this environment? Um, so you take a room, right? Um, a, a kind of shallow ceilinged room and introduce um, natural elements to it so that you can literally imagine what the soil would um, smell like, which we can kind of all guess that, right? Because we've all picked up dirt or you've had dirt around, or excuse me, soil. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> well soil <done>. around. <laughs> <laughs> um, what it smells like, what it feels like, the temperature of it. This woman, although she's a scientist, she's, she's also a builder. She works a lot with wood. She, she wants to get in there with her hands. When I said, I need more roots, I'm going to get them. She was out there going. Um, so I actually had to calm her down a little bit. We can't build an installation in three days um, if we want to sleep. You know, the, it's all about compromise. And we too, I think, the first day especially, Kind of walked, <laughs> kind of walked the same path, but we were kind of over here. Um, um, so trying to figure this out, and how are we going to put these two things together? Um, and uh, and it was probably more so on my part because I had already learned so much from her. What can I possibly offer her? Well, it's pretty, but it needs to be a different color. Start to um, kind of doubt yourself, and I go back to that story that she told about Mike, which made us both giggle. Um, I said to her, I said, well, did you explain to him what we're doing and why we're going to get these shrubs? And she said, no, why would I do that? And I said, what do you mean? Why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> um, and, and, you know, there were talks about, well, practicality and it's, you know, these, these plants, some of these plants, they just, they're, for, the, for these particular people, they don't serve a purpose except to get in the way. And so then I think, well, I can offer her a, a voice and a, maybe a mm -hmm. different audience as well so that when we look at the landscape next mm -hmm. time, we're not seeing just bumps in the road. We actually can um, have a different viewpoint on what that sagebrush is or what it re represents or even how it looks, that it is a incredibly beautiful plant. Um, and, and also mm -hmm. um, in our minds get away from, well, I'm really allergic to that thing. So <laughs> it automatically brings on these kind of negative thoughts. And even for me, so having sagebrush around the studio has been really interesting. <laughs> um, but um, so we started um, and she had the idea, well, there's a, there's a, a scrapyard, you know, that U-Cross has that just, you know, has just parts and things, let's go rummage. And so we found this beautiful um, wire um, and started adding actual roots to it. And I must say that all of these are sketches. I don't think 
in my mind, none of these pieces are done. I, I, I kind of bring this to the scientists. It's like the notes on the legal pad before you start the abstract, <laughs> before it's edited, before it gets published, yeah. right? Or even put into a paper where you can bring it to a conference. So, so keep that in, in mind. But um, as we started um, doing those, um, the, the kind of wandering around and grabbing plants, and which is hard when you're trying to pump up the sagebrush and you keep digging them up. Um, that you don't want to kill something in the process. So some of them have sacrificed for their people, which is good. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, there was one night where I think that day we were just, what are we going to do? And we were kind of struggling back and forth. And, and, um, and I would never arm wrestle with her. She's really strong. So I'm um, <laughs> thinking to myself, well, what are we, you know, we going to do? So I just started laying out some pieces of paper. I mean, I get to put in this sculptor. And yes, I'm a sculptor, but I'm also an artist. So whatever the idea is, it should dictate the materials and, and often does. So I put out some pieces of paper and then all of the things we had collected, things she had written down, um, photographs we had both taken and gotten off the internet, we started kind of collaging together. But it, be, it began with me just sticking some things on her paper and she at her, her uh, desk in her studio and me and we were ne right next door. So I think this was all part of Jeff's plan from yeah, the beginning. It was. Um, I just placed some things on our table and I even said, don't ask me about them until I'm done. Um, and I just put them there and I said, I just want you to look at them and respond. And I expected her as a scientist to write notation that I'm, I, I would need a dictionary to figure out what everything was. Um, I would need some extra explanation to, to bring her amazing, brilliant mind um, in words onto the paper. And that's what I got. <laughs> so she started putting things together and, um, and really working with the materials. And, and so things that came out of it maybe started like this. And then I gave it to her, and she did that. <laughs> and then after that, we kind of pondered on a little bit, and it became that. Um, so, so it was very much a give and take, some of them more dramatic than others, um, but all, I think, the beginning of a beautiful relationship <laughs> um, in terms of really speaking um, with what she's so passionate about and speaking through materials with, with what I'm so passionate about thinking about putting things together, talking about these cheatgrass seeds and how they're so um, prevalent. There's so many seeds, they, they're dispersed so quickly that it really is a, a bomb on the landscape, especially when you bring in um, the prevalence of fire and how that interacts with the cheatgrass and can really destroy the landscape in a bad way, and especially the sagebrush. So because there are these connections between all of us, there's, there's also, um, uh, things that we're comparing and contrasting. And, and for Anne and I, it was really the sagebrush and the cheatgrass, and the good, the good, the bad, the ugly, and how those interact with each other, so that they really become personalities in some way and start to talk to each other or yell at each other <laughs> or um, interact with each other in some way, shape, or form. Um, and so I'm picturing, I'm gonna be gluing all these seeds down, and no, it was her. Um, and I, yeah, at times, <laughs> at times I thought, oh my God, I'm not gonna be able to do this because we were in the studio literally one hour, like one day it was 13 hours yeah. total. And I thought, I don't, I'm not cut out for this. I don't know that I can do this. And now she closes her studio door and she won't let me in. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, I'm not gonna so bother I'm you right to be now. An <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I think we're, like I said, we're trained observers. So I've always been addicted to science and bringing in information. The more, the better, the more, the better. Um, and so it's just been amazing to have this relationship, this back and forth. And not only that, but to wonder if, you know, what if we had a million dollars and we could build whatever we wanted to. And I let her use my tools um, because I know <laughs> she'd bring them back. Um, you know, what could we come up with? You know, thinking about large scale pieces. And this is actually kind of just a, a play mock up of what a, a large scale piece could possibly look like. And this is a, a botanical center in Vancouver. Um, something that you could walk along, you can see the scale of the humans right here. Something you could walk along and it would actually hopefully enlighten and lift up the sagebrush in people's minds, um, as well as it teetering on these just particular roots so that there's that balance that we all, I think, strive for and yearn for and often don't get enough of. 
Um, and then we, we did, we did some building in the studio and created this piece and everything except for the plants themselves was from that scrap yard. Mm -hmm. um, and so now me as an artist, you know, we should have a show after this. And so we're opening up our studio after lunch when we're all done. And we're over in the Rock Studios, which is just a hop, skip, and jump away. So we're inviting you to come and see these sketches that we've created, to come see what it is that we've put together. Um, together. It really was a 50-50 um, relationship and um, so amazing. And um, I didn't have to teach her how, how to create art. She's already an artist. Um, it was just nice, I think, to be able to offer her a different voice and also give her hopefully some confidence. So there were lots of moments where she's, she stopped herself before she even started. You know, well, what if, you know, what, what about the audience? What if they don't get this? And, um, you know, what if this doesn't happen, the idea? And, you know, what if, what if? And I said, you need to shut that little voice up, right? <laughs> because otherwise, we're never going to make anything. Um, and I think that's true for everyone, right? It's not just artist specific. Um, but, you know, quiet that voice down and let's just see what happens. And if, you know, if it fails, it fails, but we'll still get something out of it. And that didn't happen. I don't think there's any failures here. I think it's just, you know, it could just keep going and going. And, and hopefully we can come back in a year, this group of ours. And really, you know, there's already a, a stop animation that I have in my head. I'm just not able to keep up with the materials of things I want to make. I have years of work that's coming out of this experience and I would do it over and over and over again, for sure. Um, except maybe for the documentation part of it, right? <laughs> um, you know, all of these works were done as a balance between Anne and I, compromising, listening, and responding to each other. And I just, mm -hmm. I cherished it. So I, I really, you know, I just thank her for being so patient with me and for putting up with my mess. And, you know, it was kind of a stark difference between her studio and my studio. And, <laughs> um, and at the end, dirt was everywhere. So it was great. Um, was good thing we didn't have to put in a deposit, soil. right? Soil. <laughs> It's a very cute sculpture. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. She yeah. used the soil word, so I get to use the cute word. <laughs> <laughs> That'll teach me, right? Yeah. I'm still learning. That, and that's so, what's also so amazing about this experience is that you're not only a teacher or a, you know, a teacher in this realm, but you're a student as well. And we've done both the entire time. Um, so, so hopefully she's gotten a lot from me. I know I've gotten a lot from her. And, and I just want to um, also thank you, Cross. They have spoiled us rotten since we've been here. And it's so nice. I mean, Jeff's bothering us all the time. So to not have to stop for lunch and they hand deliver it and those kinds of things has been um, just lovely. And, um, and so um, we really appreciate you and that you allowed us to come here. So thank you. And Ashley, that was, that was also really cool. Yeah. Uh, I really, um, one thing that, there are a couple things just right off from the beginning, and when you were saying you bring people out and ask them about their perceptions of the, of the landscape, and as, for me, as an, uh, an ecologist who was, you know, raised in the northern hardwoods of Vermont, uh, <laughs> that's where all of my understanding of nature comes from. And so when I first came out here last year, uh, I came out on the landscape and my very first day, we, uh, it was about 97 degrees. It was like crispy and dry as a bone up in the hills. And we walked probably nine miles straight across the, across the whole ranch. And my first impression was not calming. <laughs> and I was like, this place absolutely terrifies me. I didn't know any of the plants. And then, uh, opening, when you guys pass that box and opening that box up and then seeing some of your pieces up here was so evocative for me of the changing in my understanding of the place, uh -huh. of starting to look, you know, really going from looking around like this to looking <laughs> like this. Um, and really, uh, you know, throughout my time here over the last year and a half or so with our involvement um, in this project, I've really started to understand the beauty of this place, and it does every time I come back now, it is, I do really do feel like it is calming. And then uh, just understanding that there's so much here 
underneath the surface. Yeah. And I really, really love the, the illustrations of um, the importance of the, the roots and the underground and everything like that. It's just, it's just right. beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that struck me, especially towards the end, and as you were showing all of those little tiny pieces and everything was, um, you know, I think that it's really easy. Uh, I mean, Charlie is a scientist and I'm definitely kind of on the people side and I don't know. So we've always kind of had this, uh, this tension, not tension, but just, you know, difference of how we pro work and how we think of our process and everything. And um, as you were showing this, I was just really kind of reminded that there are a lot of similarities in a way of kind of, of the detail and the attention to, you know, each tiny piece kind of all pulling it all together. Um, and that, that was really striking to me because it, it just, you know, you think it's so different that, you know, a, an artist is, you know, broad strokes and it's, you know, done or something. And then a scientist is like, you know, just staring at a computer all the time. And, and that's so different. And you, you see that really clearly, I think, in the work that you were putting together. That was really fascinating. There's a lot of stereotypes in all of our perspectives. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, a couple of the, yeah, a couple of things I really like. You could really see the wind in a lot of a lot of the pieces that you're putting together, yeah. which especially on a day like today, it's just it's such an important part of this place. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's really strange to have days where you don't have wind out here. Yeah. And uh, I really like that that yeah. uh, sort of extra piece coming in there. Yeah. And Anne, I was wondering how, because um, I think. You know, Ashley, as you were talking, like it's it's easy to kind of soak in a lot of the science in you know understanding the place, and um, and I thought that was beautiful what you were saying about being a voice for the sagebrush. Um, that was great, but um, but Anna, I was just wondering how you know do you think that you'll bring in some kind of component to a classroom project or um, you know in in kind of using a different form of expression maybe than than you already do. One of the courses that I teach is really, uh, I teach a required course in range management. And of course, range management students are looking for the utility of the landscape. So they're looking for forage production. So they often clip the grasses off, dry them, weigh them, and get biomass production and say, how many pounds of animal can I get off of this acre? And so. It's really important to me to communicate to my students that they need to transcend that perception of the landscape and be able to communicate with a diversity of audiences about other values of the landscape. Just as, as uh, Ashley went out on the landscape and loved the beautiful pink on the slopes, and really, <laughs> she made those first two images, she cleaned up that slope by getting rid of the sagebrush. <laughs> <laughs> because it's what I would automatically be most attracted yeah. to. For me, visually, the sagebrush, because they're, you know, I mean, we know there's a, a rhyme or reason, but right. in terms of um, a design of where they're placed, it's distracting. Um, and so, um, so that was one, of our, was one of our conversations. So this is about me kind of changing my perception and how I feel about the sagebrush and whatnot. And mainly because I'm allergic to it. So, so you, you automatically just have this negative you know, label that's put on it when this is about seeing past that, right? And not only that, but seeing past what it does to me, but what it, what it does for the environment itself, which is huge. So incorporating that into the classroom, for example, um, when, I, when they say, well, we could get more production if we thin that brush out, right? And so then you have to ask about things like wildlife conservation. And if you're working with wildlife conservation folks, you know, the importance of species that depend on it. And we talked with Michael about as much as the pollinators are subject to temperature, how that changes the above ground temperature patterns on that landscape, to train young range scientists to understand that it is all connected. And you can't get past the communication obstacles if you don't make yourself willing to perceive that landscape from a different perspective. And so I'm sure that these slides, some of these slides are going to be incorporated into my classroom. Questions, comments, observations? Yeah. Uh, 
theme I've heard a couple times from you is this tension between the beloved and the despised and how that can shift based on your perspectives. Um, Ashley, would you say that's a theme that you have explored in the past in some of your work, or is this a new thing for you? This is a new thing for me. It is, yeah, which is really exciting. I mean, I've always kind of um, looked at the above ground because I, I wanted to make sure that humans could relate to it in some way, shape, or form, not even thinking that they can relate to roots. I mean, there are roots in, in everything, right? Even in the title of this, um, this talk that we just gave, Wyoming Roots, you hear that so much. Um, so, I, you know, it, it hasn't been in the past, but, um, but it is now. Yeah, for a long time to come, for sure. Um, I've had some botany training and have done my share of herbarium um, pages with the label down in the lower right-hand corner. And, and I, lo I loved your collages. I loved how you could, you're, it's still an herbarium. Or it's, you're still giving the essence of the plant, but, but you can do it in an artistic way. And uh, those were great. And I think I, in my mind, I was expecting her to do that, right? To label everything. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted her to, right? So that maybe even that would bring science even more, right? Because it, it gave them a little something that they could they could relate to in a different way. But that's not where she took it, and it was a, it was exciting even more, I think, to see her open up and 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 open her mind to be able to, to do that in so many ways. And she's already good with her hands. I mean, I really didn't have to show her much. She she just took to it like a duck to water. But the tendency was that, you know, Ashley would bring me these beautiful plants and I would never write on these things, right, you know? And so <laughs> she really had to, I had to be schooled in, yes, you can write on these, I can change things, I can fix things. And the other half of that is the scientist half that said, well, you didn't record where you collected it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm intrigued by listening to this and the others is this relationship between knowing and seeing, right? Yeah. That when we see something in a new way, we can actually know something we didn't know. And when we know something we didn't know, we actually see the world in a different way. Could you mm -hmm. say something about this knowing, seeing thing? Right? I so, see everything differently. Now, that, <laughs> now I'm, not, I'm not quite as, I think, visually attracted to that pain. Now it's more, it's more of a burden, right? It's, it's more of, well, it's there, but it's taken over. And um, this invasive species, um, you know, it needs more balance um, in some way, shape, or form. Even that means get it the hell out of here. Um, uh, so, and especially the sagebrush, too, I think. You know, I mean, these particular ones, like I said, they sacrifice for their people. Thank you very much. But, um, <laughs> You know, we and we just literally added a, a, a very non-toxic glue to sagebrush, and it just it brought out all these amazing colors that I think normally you wouldn't you wouldn't pay attention to, um, and it, and it, and it wasn't necessarily something in the material. It just um, it just enhanced it um, with what it already had from from Mother Nature. So um, so it's changed the way I view things a lot. I I can't speak for I am, but. What it's done for me is realize that there's a lot more to uh, communicate this notion of perception and values. You know, I had always done that before, but I had always done it in terms of usefulness of the landscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you want to produce cattle, maybe you want to remove the shrubs. If you like sage grass, maybe you want the shrubs there. If you need a microhabitat for the bees, I'd always done it sort of still in the scientific world. And now I can incorporate the knowing of color and this idea of balance. And I'm still going to keep working on actually about, you know, we could put these shrubs back in here strategically and, <laughs> and get the balance back the way that it needs to be artistically. But just the reminder that I know that there are many folks out there that simply perceive it is uh, a story that an old friend of mine, Tom Whitson, if any of you know, weed scientist in the state, you know that name, and he stopped at a rest area that there was uh, an expanse of sagebrush, and a car pulled in from somewhere in the east, I won't name the state, but <laughs> <laughs> and a woman got out, and he was standing there looking over the sagebrush, and she said, yeah, you, you know, when those trees grow up, you're really gonna have a nice forest. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting that Wyoming 
tends to understand itself in, in, in these plant metaphors, right? Um, you know, we, we're upset when our seeds leave the state, <laughs> right? Because we want them to be rooted. And yeah. so, you know, we, we, we are a very sort of plant metaphorical people in Wyoming, but it's not something that we really, I, I think that we tapped into as powerfully as we could. And I would say on the other side of that, if you're a transplant, it's sometimes it's hard to put your roots down. <laughs> <laughs> and try not to be an invasive species. <laughs> All right, um, I just want to say a couple things before we go take the break. One is, Ashley uses this word, which is an art word, which to a scientist means something else. She talks about sketches in which you might think that things are two-dimensional objects, right? These are sculptural sketches, so when you go over to the studio, which you really ought to do, um, there's, there's actually the three-dimensional, right? So, so these are not just flat pictures. And there's this one. This little native grass, do you still have that one? Yes. Perched. Oh, it's just, right? It's, so there's this great, there, so the, the language thing, right? Anne called it cute, right? And Ashley <laughs> said, never, ever use the word cute in reference to an artwork. <laughs> right? And then, and then re in revenge, Ashley uses dirt. So it's kind of this. <laughs> I, like, I like that. So what we've learned is how to push each other's buttons. That's really all we've learned. <laughs> all right, so now we're going to take uh, about a 15-minute break. The U-Cross Pollination Experiment was sponsored by the U-Cross Foundation, the Wyoming Humanities Council, Saturday University, the UW Biodiversity Institute, the UW Department of Philosophy, the UW Program in Creative Writing, and the UW Institute for Humanities Research.